We are now going to come to questions to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. I call Richard Graham. Number one, please. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, may I start by commending the Together initiative for organising this coming Sunday what will hopefully be the nation's biggest ever thank you day to mark the birthday of the NHS. It will provide the perfect moment to thank you not just our, uh, thank not just our amazing NHS and care workers, but also those key workers who have helped in the national effort throughout our fight against coronavirus and indeed all those across the country who have gone the extra mile for their local communities in these challenging times. I'm sure we can agree across this House that the NHS represents the very best of us and that we will always be there to support it. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister says, today is the 72nd anniversary of the NHS and a good moment for us all to appreciate the immense role of the NHS in all our constituencies, perhaps especially the Gloucestershire Royal Hospital, which has put up with me as a summer volunteer for the last 10 years. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's launch of the UK New Deal yesterday paves the way for exciting new projects. Can I highlight for his attention the proposed Eco Park and Green Energy Park in Gloucester, which may need a little of the Chancellor's oil. And can I also highlight, should it be approved, the shovel-ready new Gloucester to Cheltenham cycleway, which I hope that he might accept an invitation to come and open with my honourable friend for Cheltenham and I when it is ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, I think he, I thank my honourable friend very much for that question and uh, I congratulate him on what he's doing to uh, support the wonderful new Eco and Green Energy Park and I look forward to joining him on the new cycleway in due course. We now can write on the wall, Sir Keir Starmer, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I, too, celebrate the birthday of the NHS, as we all will, uh, this Sunday, particularly at this time? Mr Speaker, at the Daily Press Conference on the 18th of June, the Health Secretary said there's an outbreak of COVID-19 right now in parts of Leicester. Yet it was only on Monday evening this week that the Government introduced restrictions. That's a delay of 11 days during which the virus was spreading in Leicester. Why was the government so slow to act? Prime Minister. Uh, well, actually, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the government first uh, took notice and acted on what was going on in Leicester on the, uh, on the 8th of, of June because we could see that there was a, an issue there. We sent, uh, we sent uh, mobile testing uh, units, formal mobile testing units, shortly thereafter. We engaged uh, actively with the uh, authorities in Leicester, with public health in Leicester, with everybody responsible in Leicester, uh, in the way that we've done uh, with other uh, areas that have had similar issues. Uh, unfortunately, in Leicester, it did not prove possible to uh, get the results that we've seen uh, elsewhere. So on Monday, uh, we took the decision, uh, to, which I hope the uh, right honourable gentleman approves of, uh, to go into lockdown uh, in Leicester, uh, because I've been absolutely clear with the House and uh, with the country uh, that we are going forward. We've made huge progress, but where necessary, we will put on the brakes. Uh, we acted decisively, and I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I do support the Government's decision of Monday, uh, but I think the 4,000 businesses and the 160 schools that are now shut might take some persuading that the Government acted quickly enough. One of the problems in Leicester was the local authority only had half of the data. They had data for Pillar 1 Covid tests, that's NHS, care workers and tests in hospitals. They didn't have Pillar 2 tests, the wider tests in the community. Now that may sound technical, but what that meant, what that meant was that the local authority thought there were 80 positive tests in the last fortnight when the real figure was 944. The local authority was only given the real figure last Thursday. So there was a lost week whilst the virus was spreading. There are now real fears, Mr Speaker, of further local lockdowns across the country. Can the Prime Minister give a cast-iron guarantee today that no other local authority will ever be put in that position again? 
Prime Minister. Uh, well, actually, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid the right honourable gentleman uh, is mistaken because uh, uh, both, both Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 data have been shared uh, not just with Leicester but with all uh, authorities, uh, Mr. Speaker, across, across the country. And uh, we did in Leicester exactly what we did, uh, for instance, Mr. Speaker, in Kirklees uh, or in Bradford uh, or in uh, Western Supermare or, or other places where very effective whack a mole strategies have been put in place. Uh, for, for reasons that uh, I, I think the House will probably understand, there were particular problems uh, in Leicester in implementing uh, the advice and getting uh, people to understand what was necessary uh, to do. Uh, but let's face it, uh, we've had to act. The government has acted, and uh, he wants to know whether we'll, we'll act in future, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ensure that we protect the health of the entire country. And I can tell him that we will. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I spoke to the Mayor of Leicester this morning and I know the Prime Minister spoke to him yesterday and it is absolutely clear that he didn't get that data till last Thursday. I doubt he told the Prime Minister something different yesterday. The Prime Minister can't just bat away challenge. These are matters of life and death and the people's livelihoods. An example of this, Mr Speaker, last week the member for Hove asked the Prime Minister how can seaside towns be expected to cope with likely influx of visitors to beaches and parks during the hot weather. The Prime Minister replied, show some guts. Two days later, Bournemouth Beach was closed with 500,000 visitors. A major incident was declared. Does the Prime Minister now regret being so flippant? Prime Minister. I, I, really, I really think that the right honourable gentleman does not distinguish himself by his question because uh, I, I, was, I was making it absolutely clear that as we go forward uh, with our plan, our cautious plan for opening up the economy, uh, it is very, very important that people who do represent uh, seaside communities, places where uh, UK tourists uh, will want to go, uh, should be as welcoming as they can possibly be. That was the message uh, that I think is, is important to set out. But it is also vital that people have to behave responsibly. Yeah. And, that is, and that is why the scenes in Bournemouth were completely unacceptable, and that is why we stick to the advice that we have given. And we're ma I made it absolutely clear that people, if they're going to uh, travel to the seaside, if they're going to uh, take advantage of the uh, easing of the lockdown, then they must observe social distancing, and it is everybody's responsibility to ensure that is the case. Yes, Starmer. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister must understand why this is of such concern. There's nationwide lifting of restrictions this weekend. Without an app, without clear data for local authorities or the world-beating system we were promised. Last week, I do support it, but I'm not blind. I support the easing of restrictions, but unlike the Prime Minister, I'm not blind to the risks. And I don't think anybody else should be. Two thirds. Last week, I pointed out to the Prime Minister that two thirds of people with COVID-19 are not being reached and asked to provide their contact details. The Prime Minister typically said it was all a stunning success. The updated figures now show that things have got worse. Of the 22,000 new cases of COVID infections per week in mid-June, just 5,000 were reached and asked to provide details. So now three quarters of people with COVID-19 are not being reached. How did the Prime Minister explain that? Mr Speaker, as he knows very well, the a test, track and trace operation is actually reaching a huge numbers of people and causing them uh, to self-isolate in ways that I don't think he conceivably could have expected a month ago when this system was set up. Uh, it, it has now reached 113,000 contacts, 113,000 contacts uh, who have undertaken to self-isolate to stop the disease spreading, and that is why... We're now seeing the number of diseases, the number of new infections come down uh, for several days running now to below 1,000. The number of deaths uh, continues to come down. And that is a great achievement uh, on the part of the entire population and their willingness to support Test and Trace. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister can't see that if three quarters of those with COVID-19 are not being contacted and asked for their own contacts... That is a real gap in the system. You can't just brush it away by referencing those that are contacted. It's a real problem and it's growing and it's going to have to be addressed. 
Prime Minister did this at, at phase one, brushing away serious concerns. Yeah, yeah. I want to turn to the Prime Minister's speech yesterday, if I may, Mr Speaker. Amid the normal bluster, there was a really striking line in that speech. The Prime Minister said, we know that the jobs many people had in January are not coming back. I fear that this is the equivalent line to the line in the Prime Minister's speech of March the 12th, when he said, I must level with you. Many more families are going to lose loved ones before their time. And we know what happened next. That's why there needs to be a laser-like focus on protecting jobs. So how many jobs does the Prime Minister think yesterday's announcement will protect? Uh, Mr Sir. Speaker, I think he first of all might pay tribute to the work of this government in protecting 11 million jobs yeah. uh, throughout this crisis. Uh, he, might, he might draw attention to the fact uh, that we've supported huge sectors of the UK economy at a cost of £120 billion. And I'm not going to give a figure for the number of job losses that may or may not uh, take place, but of course uh, the risk is very, very serious, as he, rightly, as he rightly says. But that is why we're proceeding with uh, the New Deal, the Fair Deal for the British people, which will be not just massive investment in our National Health Service, £34 billion in our NHS, £14 billion po- pounds more into our schools, but a uh, a, an investment in infrastructure going up to £100 billion. Pounds. That, we are going to build, build, build and deliver jobs, jobs, jobs for the people of this country. Keir Starmer. The reality is, Mr Speaker, that the Prime Minister's announcement yesterday was investment equivalent to less than £100 pounds per person across the United Kingdom, 0.2% of GDP. Not much of his announcement was new, and it certainly wasn't much of a deal. Yeah. Meanwhile, as the Prime Minister was speaking, Airbus announced 1,700 job losses, EasyJet 1,300 job losses, TM Lewin and Harvest 800 job losses. That's just yesterday. And there was nothing in the Prime Minister's speech for the 3.2 million people in hospitality or the 2.9 million in retail. Next week's financial statement could be the last chance to save millions of jobs. Will the Prime Minister start now by extending the furlough scheme for those parts of the economy that are still most at risk. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let me just uh, repeat and remind the House that overall this package represents a £600 billion package of investment in the UK economy. But the best single thing we can do is get our economy back to health by getting our people back into work and getting the virus defeated and under control. And the best thing actually uh, that the opposition could do is stop equivocating and doing one thing one, one week and one thing another week this week and decide that they emphatically, they emphatically support ending of an and they emphatically support uh, kids being back in school rather than being bossed around, rather than being bossed around uh, by, by the unions. Mr Speaker, we are the builders, they're the blockers, we're the doers, they're the ditherers. We're going to get on with it and take this country forward. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend not share my anger and the frustration of the Scottish tourist sector, just as it's getting back on its feet, that it's having the legs pulled out from under it by deeply irresponsible, damaging and divisive talk of arbitrary border closures and quarantining of visitors from across the rest of the United Kingdom. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I must say I find the, the suggestion absolutely astonishing and shameful. There will be no such discussions uh, with the Scottish uh, administration about that. Uh, but I would point out to my honourable friend what he knows very well. There is no such thing as a border between England and Scotland. Talking of which, we come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure that the thoughts of everyone in the House will be with me and those that were caught up in the terrible incidents in Glasgow last Friday, in particular with PC David White and those that went to do their duty. And we hope that everyone makes a speedy recovery from their injuries. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Prime Minister delivered his self-proclaimed relaunch speech. But when asked what new money will be given to the Scottish Government at the daily press briefing, the Prime Minister's official spokesperson laughed. Laughed, Mr Speaker. That's what this Government thinks about funding for the Scottish economy. Jobs, families and livelihoods. They think it's a joke. Is the Prime Minister capable of answering a direct question? And I don't want the usual waffle. It's a straightforward question. 
What are the new Barnet consequentials coming to Scotland as a result of yesterday's speech? Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, I, I, I think he probably does uh, the spokesman in, in question a, a serious injustice because I think he, uh, I, I don't believe that he would have taken this issue anything other than seriously because it's, an, it's quite astonishing fact that already. Or he should wait till next week to have the full Barnet consequentials for, uh, for what we're outlining from uh, my right honourable friend, the, the Chancellor. But uh, I think I, I really do hope that he and all his SNP colleagues uh, go around brandishing the fact that not only uh, has this crisis seen uh, the, the, the British Army, uh, the British Armed Services, absolutely indispensable in Scotland and elsewhere in helping us get through it, but they have seen the UK Treasury, the UK Treasury, step up to the plate and get that furlough funding across all four parts of our United Kingdom. And, and it was a massive success. And let, and let, me, let me tell them that already the, Bar, the Barnet consequentials amount to £3.8 billion for Scotland. Going back to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Well, the Prime Minister simply couldn't answer the question because the question was, what were the Barnet consequentials out of yesterday? And we know, Mr Speaker, that there was not a single penny for Scotland out of what was supposed to be a reset speech from the Prime Minister yesterday. This was a speech devoid of, devoid of action, devoid of ambition and devoid of any support for the most vulnerable in our society. The Prime Minister has set the UK on a two-tiered recovery on the same day that he delivered his speech. This Tory government reintroduced its benefits sanction regime after a three-month freeze. That's not levelling up. It's heartless. It's cruel. It's unnecessary. Well, the Prime Minister announced right now that he will keep the freeze on benefits sanctions or will we have to wait till he's shamed into yet another U-turn? Uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, you know, I, I, I beseech the honourable gentleman, right honourable gentleman, just to think that he may be mistaken. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the UK government is is uh, absolutely de dedicated to supporting uh, people of, of all incomes across this country. That's why we've actually increased uh, spending on benefits by seven billion pounds uh, with universal credit, and we stand ready, and we stand ready to do more. But I can tell him that there will be plenty of wonderful things uh, that we want. To to do uh, with him, working with him, working with the Scottish administration uh, to improve transport and other infrastructure across the whole of the United Kingdom, including Scotland. So I think I, I really hope that he will cooperate. We're now heading to Nikki Aitken. Nikki Aitken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituency sits at the heart of our great metropolis. The cities of London and Westminster is the home of the West End whose theatres and cultural venues such as the Royal Albert Hall, the London Palladium and the Barbican Centre attract visitors from across the globe and will help power our economic recovery. Does my right honourable friend share my aspiration to see these venues open as soon as it is safe to do so, ensuring that the show must go on? Minister. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, the show must go on. I know, I know the power of the uh, the theatres of, uh, of London's West End, of the entire uh, cultural industry in London, uh, not, not just as a magnet for our country, but the sheer revenues uh, they deliver. We want you going as fast as we possibly can, and we want to get life uh, for theatres and for theatre goers uh, to get back to normal as fast as we possibly can. But to do that, we have to defeat uh, this disease, and that is what this government is engaged in. Stephen Furry. Mr Speaker, six months from today exactly, the Northern Ireland Protocol sadly comes into operation. The Government has already recognised that will involve checks and infrastructure with regard to, to regulation, which the Prime Minister knows is different from customs. So therefore, given that the business community is desperately seeking answers as to how the processes will work in detail, can the Prime Minister commit to providing that clarity before the end of this summer? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, it's very clear from the from the from the existing text of the of the protocol uh, that Northern Ireland is and remains a part of the customs territory of the United Kingdom, and there shall be unfettered access between the, the uh, all parts uh, of the United Kingdom, and that's what we're going to ensure. Jameson. Mr. Speaker, what message might the Prime Minister have for the people of Hong Kong? following the passage this week of China's new national security law. Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. We, we stand for rules and obligations, 
and we think that is the soundest base, basis for our international relations. And the enactment and imposition of this national security law constitutes a clear and serious breach of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. It violates Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and is in direct conflict with Hong Kong basic law. The law also threatens the freedoms and rights protected by the Joint Declaration. We made clear, Mr Speaker, that if China continued down this path, we would introduce a new route for those with British national overseas status to enter the UK, granting them limited leave to remain with the ability to live and work in the UK and thereafter to apply for citizenship. And that is precisely what we will do now. We're now heading to Belfast, so with Claire Hanna. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister, this morning and last week, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee heard from victims and survivors about the government's Troubles Legacy proposals, whether they were injured and bereaved uh, by the IRA, by loyalist paramilitaries or by security forces. Those victims have rejected these proposals, which they say close the door on truth and justice. The proposals depart from those agreed by all parties, including the UK government, which had embedded the principle that all are equal before the law. Prime Minister, the statement of the 18th of March said that the proposal sought to put victims first and to build a broad consensus among victims. It's clear from our evidence sessions that these proposals can do neither. Will the Prime Minister please resign from the March statement and return to the principles embedded in the Stormont House Agreement and indeed in January's Stormont Deal? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the victims have waited uh, too long uh, for these payments and the way to unblock the progress is for the designation of a department to provide support for the Victims Payments Board. The Justice Minister has indicated that she is prepared to take on that role and so the Executive must now move formally to designate and to prevent any further delay for victims. Christine Jardin. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Prime Minister, there are three million people in this country at the moment who get no support because of self-employed run contracts. Our black, Asian and ethnic minority communities have an employment rate which is twice the national average and women are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. The Prime Minister said a few minutes ago he stands ready to help. Will he look at a universal basic income so these people can get the help that they need now? Uh, well, she raises a very important point about the, the self-employed, though, though we have given very considerable uh, support, as, as she knows, uh, as part of the overall package of £120 billion uh, to support, I think, £22 billion altogether uh, through the, 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 uh, the furloughing scheme for employed and self-employed people. Uh, but uh, her further suggestion for a, for a universal basic income is one that we have looked at, where what the, the best way forward for our country is to get the disease under control in the way that we are doing, get our people back into work, build, 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 and take this country forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it was great to have my right honourable friend in the black country announcing his new vision yesterday, and perhaps yeah, yeah. next time he's in the black country, if he comes five minutes down the road to Tipton, we can sort him out a pint in the pie factory. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I was recently lobbied by two students in my constituency, Elliot Wilkes from Samwell Academy and um, Will, Will Gill from the Q3 Academy in Tipton, who want to know this. They want, they want a reassurance from the Prime Minister that after years of neglect, years of being overlooked in our communities, in Wensbury, Oldbury and Tipton, that after his announcement yesterday, we will finally get the recognition for our communities that we deserve. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm trying to stick off the pies uh, at the moment, but we will, I can tell, you can tell his, uh, you can tell his, his communities in Tipton, we are investing massively, not just in education, as I say, £14 billion uh, more into uh, our schools, uh, but also in infrastructure that will reach every corner of of the country, uh, particularly the Mid and the West Midlands, and I'm delighted that West Bromwich will receive at least £500,000 from the Stronger Towns Fund uh, this year to support their high street and local community. James Day. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Nat Art Centre in my constituency is rightly proud of the work that it has done during lockdown, responding to the needs of young people and disability theatre groups in Bury. But its income has been decimated due to the fact that it is unable to stage events. Will the Prime Minister continue to do everything possible to support the cultural and creative sectors in Bury, Ramsbottom, Tottington and elsewhere 
to ensure that important community assets like the Met have a bright future going forward. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Absolutely, Mr Speaker, and uh, I, I thank him for making the representations uh, that he has. Uh, we will do everything we can to get all those sectors going as fast as we can and get life to back as close to normal as possible uh, for as many people as possible in this country. But the way to do that, Mr Speaker, at the risk of repeating myself, is to continue to defeat the virus and uh, take the country forward. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Enfield Southgate is home to Chicken Shed Theatre, an inclusive youth theatre company open for over 40 years, but it's now struggling financially. And despite the arts sector contributing over 5.2 billion each year to our economy, the government has failed to assist it as it hurtles towards the brink of collapse due to the coronavirus pandemic. So will the Prime Minister heed the calls from the Musicians' Union, back to an equity and provide the financial support to ensure the survival of the arts sector? Well, 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 yes, Mr Speaker, this is becoming quite a theme this morning, and quite, uh, this often, quite rightly, too. I'm a fan of, of Chicken Shed uh, Theatre. I, I, I know their work. We will do everything we can uh, to assist. And uh, the economic case for, for doing so is overwhelming. I would just say to people, you know, uh, keep supporting your workers you know, with the furloughing scheme. It's much, much better now to wait for times uh, to get better rather than laying people off. That's my message. Heading to North Cumbria with Dr Neil Hudson. Dr Neil Hudson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Newton Rigg College is a land-based further education college in Penrith that has been listed for possible closure next year by its host institution. Will my right honourable friend ask government departments to work with me and local stakeholders to secure a sustainable future for this vital institution? And if we are successful, can I invite the Prime Minister to come to Penrith to see this fantastic college and the opportunities it provides to upskill, strengthen rural economies and support this government's levelling up agenda? Prime Minister. Uh, well, I'm very grateful to my, to my honourable friend. And I, I know this will be a, a difficult time for the community and all those who, uh, who care about Penrith College. Can I, can I propose to him that uh, he and I have a proper conversation about what we can do uh, to help with my, uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State uh, for Education, and see if we can find uh, an appropriate uh, solution. But I thank him very much for the work that he's doing. Speaker, the Prime Minister doesn't want to talk about the numbers of job losses, so let me give him some. British Airways, 12,000 jobs potentially to go, including in the Vale of Glamorgan, in Llantrisant and in Blackwood. GE, 1,400 jobs potentially to go at Nankara. Rolls-Royce, 6,000 nearly to go in Derby, Solihull, Glasgow, Rotherham. And, of course, as my right honourable friend has pointed out, Airbus, 1,700 jobs potentially to go in North Wales and in the South West, affecting my own constituents. Workers at those plants don't want to hear slogans. They don't want to hear bluff and bluster. They want to know from the Prime Minister what he is going to do to save those jobs in the long term. They've had the furlough scheme. What's he going to do to protect them going forward? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I don't wish to accuse the Honourable Gentleman of, uh, of, of failing to listen uh, to what I've been saying over the last uh, few days. But uh, what we, not uh, in addition to the £120 billion of support that we have put into the economy, uh, we have to recognise that people now are, as, as, he, as he says, uh, worried about their jobs. And that is why we have... a a, a plan to build, 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 a £600 billion programme of investment and, and to deliver jobs, jobs, jobs. And for sectors across the country where, there, where we need to keep young people in particular in employment, uh, we have offered, as he knows, Mr Speaker, an opportunity guarantee so that they will have either an apprenticeship or an in-work placement or the opportunity for training. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, the pubs are reopening, but we still won't be able to go to the Marsden Jazz Festival, Slathwaite Philharmonic, Homeforth Picture Drome, Lawrence Batley Theatre or even Honley Male Voice Choir Concert. Will the Prime Minister, in an effort to support the thousands of musicians, actors, dancers across the country who are struggling, look at replenishing the Arts Council's funds that have been redirected to the emergency Covid response so that we can have a vibrant creative industries coming out of this crisis? Jobs of Parliament. Mr Speaker, the House is, pretty, is speaking with pretty much one voice this morning. Uh, and, and I, uh, and I totally share uh, people's sense of urgency about wanting to get our wonderful creative culture, uh, theatrical sector open as fast as we can. But the House will also remember that what we're trying to do now involves striking a balance. And it is very, very important as we open up the economy that we do not go too far and risk a second spike and risk further outbreaks. People can see what's happening uh, in Leicester, for instance. We need to be very, very careful that we do this in a prudent way. And as we open 
the theatres, which we will, we want to make sure that we can do it in a COVID-compliant and COVID-secure way. And I'm sure that's what the House would want. But, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I say it was excellent to see the Prime Minister participating yesterday in the Christians in Parliament event. And I, I thank him for the kind remarks that he made about uh, answered prayer for his own health. And I wish him continued good health in the future. The Prime Minister said yesterday in a major speech that he wants the economy to build Build, build, and he announced that there was going to be 4,000 zero emission buses for the United Kingdom. Will the Prime Minister ensure that those 4,000 new zero emission buses are hydrogen buses that will produce jobs and deliver a new green economy for the whole of the United Kingdom? And will he invest, invest, invest in hydrogen? Well, we will certainly invest massively in hydrogen, uh, Mr Speaker. I can't make any particular undertakings about uh, where those contracts will go uh, now. Uh, but but, as he, but as, as, he knows, uh, as he knows well, I'm a big fan of buses made in Ballymena. <laughs> Don't come back. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, following the publication of MHCLG's report on the 8th of June into the risks of fraud and corruption in local government procurement, does the Prime Minister agree that procurement fraud betrays the taxpayer? It erodes public trust in our democratic systems, and we should take firm action against those that waste our public money. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I certainly do, Mr Speaker, and I think that uh, fraud is corrosive uh, of, of public trust and wasteful of public money, and it is absolutely vital that uh, all councillors learn the lessons of that report. And I thank him for drawing it to the attention of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, at Year 6, children on free school meals are nine months behind their better-off co- uh, classmates. By GCSE year, that extends to 18 months. 700,000 children have had no access to the internet for schoolwork during the lockdown. If the Prime Minister is sincere about wanting to level up and make this country good for everyone, will he give government time to pass a cross-party bill giving internet access and devices to all children on free school meals? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I I passionately support the objective of making sure that there is is, uh, uh, IT fairness and all kids have access to the technology that they need. We've rolled out huge numbers of laptops across the country uh, to to kids on, uh, to pupils on on free school meals. But uh, the most important thing that I think should happen now is that all pupils in uh, year six should now be back in school and it's still very disappointing that we haven't had an unequivocal declaration of support for the safety of schools from the party opposite. Greg Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Enterprise zone status at Silverstone Park and Westcott in my constituency has been critical in bringing high-tech innovators to Buckinghamshire across 5G, rocketry, automotive and motorsport. Will my right honourable friend join me in congratulating these wealth creators, innovators and entrepreneurs and commit to extending their enterprise zone status and business rate relief period from 2021 to 2024 to ensure they continue to be an engine of economic growth? Prime Minister. Well, I will certainly look at the proposal that he makes. I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, will want to, to study it. Uh, but I, sir, I also congratulate uh, what everybody involved with the Aylesbury Vale Enterprise Zone uh, for the cutting edge uh, technology that exemplifies the very best of this country and shows the way uh, to, to our future. Stephen Jims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government was right to raise universal credit by £20 a week at the start of the crisis, but other benefits, like employment and support allowance, claimed by other people in identical circumstances, was not raised. The All Party Working Pension Select Committee recommended unanimously last week that those legacy benefits should be brought back into line with universal credit and raised. That's since been endorsed by the former Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Member for Purcelli. Will the Prime Minister endorse it as well? Well, Mr Speaker, we've done a huge amount, uh, and he's a tireless campaigner on this matter, but I think the House will uh, accept that we've done a huge amount to uh, increase uh, support for people uh, on benefits, and uh, I remind him that the uh, increase in uh, universal credit and working tax credit uh, is up to £1,040 a year, uh, benefiting 4 million families across this country. 
Well, Lim Black, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the state of us, my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and I will be among the first in these socially distanced queues as barbers and hairdressers reopen this weekend. But neither of us is likely to be queuing for an appointment at a beauty salon. Mr. Speaker, sadly, sadly, as much needed as it may be, sadly, neither will anybody else, as many of these much loved businesses remain closed. Will the Prime Minister review this decision? so that the likes of lush beauty and Romilly in my constituency can reopen safely as soon as possible. <laughs> well, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm sure that one day I'll be going with him to lush beauty. But it is a sad reality uh, for, for many of these excellent businesses that they cannot yet open uh, in the way that they want to, and I, I certainly share... Uh, his sense of urgency, uh, and I know that people feel it across the country, and they feel a sense of, uh, of unfairness when they look at, uh, at hairdressers opening, uh, for instance. I just must repeat to the House the, n- the need to, to strike the balance that we've described, uh, that I believe uh, is understood uh, by the party opposite, and uh, the, the need also uh, to open up in a way that is Covid secure. As soon as we can do that, as soon as we're, as soon as we're sure, Mr Speaker, that nail bars, uh, that, uh, that uh, beauty salons can open in a way that are Covid secure, we will do so. Alan Dorrance. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the 17th of April 1984, I was a serving police officer in the Metropolitan Police when WPC Yvonne Fletcher was shot and killed whilst on duty policing a demonstration outside the Libyan Embassy in London. No one has ever been charged in connection with her death. In light of reports at the weekend about a civil case being brought by her former colleague, PC John Murray, against one of the main suspects, will the Prime Minister pledge to reopen the criminal inquiry into the murder of WPC Yvonne Fletcher? Well, first of all, Mr Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Gentleman very much for his uh, service in the in the police and also to thank him for raising a very important subject that I've followed for many years because the murder of Yvonne, uh, WPC Yvonne Fletcher was sickening and, and cowardly. I think the best thing I can say to uh, the Honourable Gentleman today is that I would welcome the opportunity to talk to him in person about uh, the issue that he raises uh, to, to see what we can do to take the matter forward. Scott Mann. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for confirming the virus has proceeded far enough to open tourism in Cornwall next week? Will the Prime Minister join me in politely asking visitors to Cornwall to follow the example set by local people over the past three months and strictly respect uh, distancing guidance? We want people to come and have a fantastic holiday in Cornwall. We just want them to be sensible when they're visiting. Prime Minister. I I think, um, uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend brilliantly sums up uh, the approach that we want uh, to take. Uh, we want our, uh, our seaside communities, our fantastic national uh, tourist areas, to feel confident about welcoming visitors this summer. We want loads of uh, staycations. I think we're going to get loads of uh, fantastic staycations, but we want people to observe the rules, Mr Speaker, and to keep defeating the virus. John Speller. Mr Speaker, the way the disclosure and barring scheme is operating is damaging and discriminatory. But when I raised this with you last week, Prime Prime Minister, I got the usual Home Office guff that they were considering the Supreme Court judgment. That Supreme Court judgment was in January of 2019, 18 months ago. The Lammy report highlighted this problem in 2017. So can we have no more dithering, Prime Minister? Will you sort out this scandal now? Prime Minister, Speaker, I, I, I really do congratulate the honourable gentleman on returning so fast to the fray on this, and he's absolutely right. And uh, I think the best thing I can do is uh, write to him immediately, setting out uh, what we propose to do, because I do think there are issues with uh, the DBS scheme. I think every uh, MP will have had representations from people who feel they've been unfairly treated by it. Uh, it does not need looking at, and we should look at it urgently. Final question from Mark Harper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, The Prime Minister will know uh, that the uh, the, uh, Education Secretary confirmed that he will set out this week the comprehensive plan to get every child back to school in September, which I know he strongly supports and which I do as well. Now, the Prime Minister is a great fan of buses. 
So can he confirm that that plan will also include the very significant number of children that depend on buses to get to school so they can go back to school in September as well? Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I, I can certainly confirm that and I know that my uh, right honourable friend, the uh, Secretary for Education, uh, has been working with, uh, with uh, the Department of Transport on that very matter. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am suspending the House for three minutes. Order. 